from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante. In the early days of big data and Hadoop, the focus was really on operational efficiency where ROI was largely centered on reduction of investment. Fast forward 10 years and you're seeing you know, a plethora of activity around machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence and deeper business integration as a function of machine intelligence. Welcome to this CUBE conversation, the skinny on machine intelligence. I'm Dave Vellante and I'm excited to have Jim Kabilis here up from the, the district area. Jim, great to see you. Thanks for coming to the office today. Thanks a lot, Dave. Yes, great to be here in beautiful Marlboro, Massachusetts. Yeah, so, you know, Jim, when you think about all the buzzwords in this sort of big data business, uh, I, I have to ask you, is this just sort of same wine, new bottle when we talk about all this AI and machine intelligence stuff? It's actually new wine, uh, but of course, it, there, there's various bottles and they have different vintages and much of that wine is still quite tasty, and let me just break it up for you, the skinny on machine intelligence. AI, as a buzzword and as, as a set of practices, uh, uh, really goes back, of course, to the early post-World War II era, as we all know, Alan Turing, the imitation game, and so forth. There were other uh, uh, developers, theorists, ac academics in the 40s and the 50s and 60s that pioneered in this field, so we don't want to give Alan Turing too much credit, but he was clearly a mathematician who laid down the theoretical framework for much of what we now call artificial intelligence. But when you look at artificial intelligence as an as a ever-evolving set of practices, um, the, where it began was in an area uh, that focused, uh, focused on deterministic rules, rule-driven expert systems, and that was really the state of the art of AI for a long, long time. Um, and so you had expert systems in a variety of, of areas that became useful or used in business and science and government and so forth. Cut ahead to the turn of the millennium, we are now in the 21st century, and what's different, the new wine is big data. Larger and larger data sets that can reveal great insights, patterns, correlations that might be highly useful um, if you have the right statistical modeling tools and approaches to be able to surface up these patterns um, in an automated or semi-automated fashion. So one of the core areas is what we now call machine learning, which really is using statistical models to find, to infer correlations, anomalies, uh, trends, and so forth in the data itself. And machine learning, the core approach for machine learning is something called artificial neural networks, which is essentially modeling a statistical model along the lines of how, um, at, a, at a very high level, the, the, the nervous system is made up with uh, neurons connected by synapses and so forth. It's an analog in statistical modeling called a perceptron. The whole theoretical framework of, for perceptrons actually got started in the 1950s with the first flush of AI but didn't become a practical reality until after the turn of this millennium, really after the turn of this particular decade, 2010, when we started to see not only very large big data sets emerge and uh, new approaches for managing it all like Hadoop come to the fore, but we, we, we've seen artificial neural nets get more sophisticated in terms of their capabilities and a new approach for doing machine learning, artificial neural networks with deeper layers of perceptrons, neurons, uh, called deep learning has come to the fore. With deep learning, you have new algorithms like convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, generative adversarial networks. These are different ways of surfacing up higher level abstractions in the data. For example, for face recognition and, and object recognition, voice recognition and so forth. These all depend on this new state of the art for machine learning called deep learning. So what we have now in the year 2017 is we have uh, quite a mania for all things AI. Much of it is focused on deep learning. Much of it is focused on tools that your average data scientist or your average developer increasingly can use and get very productive with and build these models and train and test them and deploy them into working applications like 
going forward, things like autonomous vehicles would be impossible without this. Right. So that's where we're at. And we'll get some of that. Um, but so you're saying that machine learning is essentially math that yeah. infers patterns from data. Exactly. And I mean, math that's new math, math that's been around for, for a while? Or? Yeah, inferring patterns from data has been done for a long time with software. Um, and we have some established approaches that in many ways predate the, the current vogue for, machine, for neural networks. We have support vector machines and decision trees and Bayesian logic and so forth. These are different ways of approaches, statistical, for inferring patterns, correlations in, in the data. They haven't gone away. They're a big part of the overall AI space, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a growing area that I've only skimmed the surface yeah, of. They've been around yeah. for many, many years. Yeah. I think SVM, for example. Okay, now, and, and describe further, add some color to deep learning. You're, you sort of yeah. painted a picture of the sort of deep layers of these machine learning algorithms and yeah. this, this, this network with some depth to it. But, but help us on better understand the difference between sort of machine learning and deep learning and then ultimately AI. Yeah, well with machine learning generally, you know, inferring patterns from data, you know, as I said, artificial neural networks, of which the deep learning networks are one uh, subset. Um, artificial neural networks can be um, of, uh, you know, basically two or more layers of perceptrons or neurons they have a relationship to each other in terms of you know, in terms of their activation according to various uh, mathematical functions. So when you look at an artificial neural network, it basically does very complex math equations through a combination of what they call scalar functions that uh, like multiplication and so forth. And then you have these nonlinear functions uh, like cosines and so forth, tangent, all the you know all that kind of math playing together in these deep structures uh, that are triggered by data, data input that's processed according to activation functions that set weights and reset the weights among all the various neural you know, processing elements and ultimately output something, the, the insight or the intelligence that you're looking for, like a yes or no, is this a face or a not a face, that these bits, uh, these incoming bits uh, are, are, are presenting. Um, or it might pre present um, uh, an output that in terms of categories. What category of face is this? A man or a woman or a child or whatever. What I'm getting is that so deep learning is more layers of these neural processing elements um, that are specialized to various functions um, to be able to abstract higher level phenomena from the data. It's not just is this a face, but like if it's if it's um, if it's a scene recognition deep learning network, it might recognize that this is a face that corresponds to a person named Dave, who also happens to be the father in the particular family scene. And by the way, this is a family scene that this deep learning network is able to you know, ascertain. Um, what I'm getting is that those are the higher level abstractions that deep learning algorithms of various sorts are, are built to, to identify and these in your view in an automated way. Okay, and these in your view all fit under the umbrella of artificial intelligence or yeah. is that sort of a, an uber field that we should be thinking yeah, about? Yeah, artificial intelligence as the broad envelope is, you know, essentially refers to any number of approaches that help to machines to think um, like humans, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, when you talk, say think like humans, what does that mean actually? You know, to do predictions like humans, to do to look for anomalies or outliers like a human might. You know, separate figure from ground, for example, in a scene. To do uh, to identify sort of the correlations or trends in a, in, in a given uh, scene. Um, like I said, to do categorization or classification based on what they're seeing in a given frame or what they're hearing in a given speech sample. Um, so you know the, the, all these cognitive processes uh, just skim the surface, are, are what AI is all about, um, d automating to a greater degree. When I say cognitive, but I'm also referring to um, affective, like emotion detection. That's another set of processes that goes on in our heads or in our hearts that mach AI, uh, based on deep learning and so forth, is able to do, depending on you know different kinds of uh, network different types of artificial neural networks are specialized particular functions and they can only perform these functions if A, they've been built and optimized for those functions and B, they've been trained with data, actual data uh, from the phenomenon of interest. Training, 
the algorithms with the actual data to determine how effective the algorithms are is the key linchpin of the process. Because without training the algorithms, you don't know if the algorithm is effective for its intended purpose. So in Wikibon, what we're doing is in the whole development process, DevOps cycle for all things AI, training the models through a process called supervised learning is absolutely essential, an essential component of ascertaining the quality of the, of the network mm -hmm. that you're, you've built. So that's the calibration and yeah, the iteration to yes. increase the accuracy and the, say, the quality of the outcome. Okay, what are some of the practical applications that you're seeing for AI and ML and <laughs> DL? Well, chatbots, you know, and voice recognition in general, Siri and Alexa and so forth, without machine learning, without deep learning to do speech recognition, those can't work, right? Okay. Um, pretty much in every field, now, for example, IT service management tools of all sorts, uh, you know, when you have a large network with, you know, that's logging data, um, you know, at the server level, at the application level, and so forth, those data logs um, are too large and too uh, complex and changing too fast for humans to be able to identify the patterns that, you know, related to issues and faults and incidents. So AI, machine learning, deep learning is being used to fathom those, pro those, you know, those anomalies and so forth in an automated fashion to be able to alert um, a human to take action like an IT administrator or to be able to trigger a response workflow, either human or automated. So AI within IT service management, hot, hot topic, and we're seeing a lot of vendors incorporate that capability into their, into their, uh, their tools. Um, like I said, in the, the broad world we live in, in terms of face recognition in Facebook, you know, the fact is when I load a new picture of myself or my family or even with some friends or brothers in it, Facebook knows lickety split whether it's, it's my brother Tom um, or it's like, it's like my wife or whoever because of face recognition, which obviously depends, well, that's not obvious, it's not obvious to everybody, depends on deep learning algorithms running inside Facebook's big data network, uh, big data uh, infrastructure, they're able to, I mean, immediately know this. Um, and we see this all around us now, speech recognition, face recognition, and we just take it for granted that it's done, and it's, but it's done through the magic of AI. I want to get to um, the, the development angle. It's, it's an area that you specialize in. You sort of, part of the reason why you, you came to Wikibon is to really focus on that whole application development angle. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, I think I want to follow the data for a bit. Because yeah. you, you mentioned that is re was really the catalyst for the resurgence in, in AI. And uh, last week at w the Wikibon research meeting, we talked about this sort of three-tiered model, edge, uh, sort of uh, as, you know, edge, edge piece. And then something in the middle, which is this aggregation point, um, uh, for all this edge data, yeah. and then cloud, which is where all, I guess, the deep modeling occurs. So sort of a three-tier model for the data flow. Yes. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on that in the context of, of, of AI. It means more data, more, I guess, opportunities for machine learning and digital twins and all this other cool stuff that's going on. But I'm really interested in how that is going to affect the application development and the programming model. John Furrier has a, a, a saying, the phrase that he says that data is the new development kit. Well, if you've got all this data that's distributed all over the place, uh, that changes the application development model, at least mm -hmm. you would think it does. So I wonder if you could comment <coughs> on sort of that, that, that edge explosion, yeah. the data explosion as a result, and what it means for application development. Right, um, so more and more deep learning algorithms are being pushed to edge devices. By that I mean smartphones and smart appliances like the ones that incorporate Alexa and so forth. And so what we're talking about is the algorithms themselves are being put into CPUs and FPGAs and ASICs and GPUs. All that stuff's getting embedded in everything that we're using increasing. Everything's got autonomous, cap more and more devices have the ability if not to be autonomous in terms of make decisions in independent of us, or simply to serve as uh, augmentation vehicles for our own, whatever we happen to be doing, thanks to the power of deep learning at the client. Okay, so when deep learning algorithms are embedded in say an Internet of Things edge device, um, what the deep learning algorithms are doing is A, they're ingesting the data through the sensors of that, that device, 
B, they're making inferences, deep learning algorithmic driven inferences based on that data. It might be speech recognition, face recognition, and you know, so are environmental sensing and being able to sense geospatially where you are and you know whether you're in a you know a hospitable climate or whatever. Um, and then the inferences um, might uh, drive uh, what we call actuation. Now, in, in, in the autonomous vehicle scenario, the autonomous vehicle is is equipped with all manner of sensors, you know, in terms of lidar and sonar and uh, GPS and so forth. And it's taking readings all the time. It's doing inferences that either autonomously or in conjunction with inferences that are being made through deep learning and machine learning algorithms that are that are executing in those intermediary hubs like you described or back in the cloud or in a combination of all of that. But ultimately, the results of all of, the, of all those analytics, all those deep learning models feed the, we call actuation of the car itself. Should it stop? Should it put on the brakes because it's about to hit a wall? Should it turn right? Should it turn left? Should it slow down because it happened to have entered a new speed uh, zone or whatever? Um, all of the, the, the decisions, the actions that the edge device, like a car would be an edge device in this scenario, are being driven by ever more complex algorithms that are trained by data. Now, the data that they're, that, so let's stay with the autonomous vehicle because that's like an extreme case of a very powerful edge device. Uh, to train an autonomous vehicle, you need, of course, lots and lots of data that's acquired from possibly a prototype that you, a Google or a Tesla, or whoever you might be, have deployed into the field or your customers mm -hmm. are using. B, proving grounds, uh, like there's one out near my stomping ground in Ann Arbor, a proving ground for the auto industry for, uh, uh, for self-driving vehicles and gaining enough real training data based on operation of these vehicles in various simulated scenarios um, and so forth. This data is used to uh, to build and iterate and refine the algorithms, the machine deep learning models that are doing the various you know operations of the not only the vehicles independent uh, in isolation, but the vehicles operating as a fleet within an entire end-to-end -end transportation system. So what I'm getting is, if you look at that three-tier model, then the edge device is the car; it's running on its, on its own algorithms. The middle tier, the hub, might be a hub that's controlling um, a uh, particular zone within a traffic system. Like in my neck of the woods, it might be a hub that's c controlling congestion management among self-driving vehicles in eastern Fairfax County, Virginia. And then the cloud itself might be managing an entire fleet of vehicles, let's say, you might have an entire fleet of vehicles under the control of, say, an Uber or whatever is managing its own cars mm -hmm. you know, from, a, from a cloud-based center. Um, so when you look at the, the tiering model then, analytics, deep learning analytics is being performed increasingly and will be for various, not just self-driving vehicles, through this tiered model because uh, the edge device needs to make decisions based on local data. The hub needs to make decisions based on a, a wider view of data across a, a wider range of edge entities. And then the cloud itself has responsibility or visibility for making you know, deep learning driven determinations for some larger swath. And it might be, you know, it might, you know, the cloud might be managing both the, the deep learning uh, driven, uh, you know, edge devices, uh, as well as m monitoring other related systems um, that, you know, the, the, that deep learning, that, that, that self-driving network needs to uh, uh, coordinate with, like uh, the government or whatever. O okay, or, so. Or police. So envisioning that three-tier model yeah. then, what, how does the programming paradigm change and evolve yeah. as a result of that? Yeah, the programming paradigm is the modeling itself, the building and the training and the iterating of the models generally will be centralized, will, will stay centralized, meaning to do all these functions, I mean, to do modeling and training and iteration mm -hmm. um, of these models, you need teams of data scientists and other developers who are both adept at statistical modeling who are adept at acquiring the training data, at labeling it, labeling is an important function there, um, and who are adept at uh, de uh, basically developing and deploying um, one model after another in an iterative fashion through DevOps, you know, through a standard release uh, uh, pipeline, 
with version controls and, and so forth built in, the governance built in. Um, and that's really, it needs to be a centralized function. And it's also very compute and data intensive, so you need uh, storage resources, you need, you know, you need uh, large clouds full of, uh, uh, you know, uh, high performance computing and so forth. Be able to handle these functions over and over. Now the edge devices themselves will feed in, feed in the data, ingest the data that is fed in, in to the centralized uh, you know, platform where the training and the modeling is done. So what we're going to see is more and more centralized modeling and training with decentralized execution of the actual inferences that are driven by those models is the way it works in this distributed environment. It's the holy grail. All right, Jim, we're out of time, but thanks very much sure. for helping us unpack the, uh, and give us the skinny <laughs> on machine learning. It's a fat stack. Great to, uh, great to have you uh, in the office and uh, to be continued. Thanks again. Sure. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Jim Kabilis, and you're watching theCUBE at the Marlboro offices. See you next time. Oh, <laughs>